All right, so we're going to begin. This is uh, Sierra Mountaineering Club broadcasting from our world international headquarters from Sacramento, California. Welcome everybody online and those of you who are here who are, who are here. I'm Darren and we're going to do a, a slideshow presentation, but we have some high tech gadgetry to throw your way to. So for those of you who are online, we'll have we'll be interspersing this with um, a view not on the camera of the presentation. And if there's anything important that we need to do close up on, then we'll work on that too. So we're here in Sacramento at our shared space with Bobcats, who is our retail partner. And I just wanted to tell everybody that there's a 60% off all apparel and 30% off all else at Bobcats happening the next 24 hours for members. So the code is for 60% off all apparel is apparel. That's two P's, okay? A-P-P-A-R-E-L, and 30% off all else, the code is SEMINAR, so you guys can use that. Um, there's also, hopefully you guys all know that there's an ongoing uh, membership benefit at this store for all the brands that he carries, which include things like Arcteryx, Mountain Hardware, La Sportiva, Petzl, the whole list, for 25% off online and 28% off in person, so that's for paid members. So um, if you don't know what that code is, email me, okay? I'll tell you. Um, here's some of the stuff that you can get 60% off. So for example, this is a nearly $400 jacket. This is now 60% off, okay? So <laughs> that puts it well below in the 200s. It's Gore-Tex Dry-Q Mountain Hardware Torsen Jacket. This would be a great jacket for anything you wanna do outside. It comes in green too. We have only a couple sizes of that. And then um, one that I use and that uh, a lot of other folks have really liked is clothing like this. This is an Outdoor Research Synthetic Puffy. It's very thin, which means it's packable and doesn't get you too hot, but it's an amazing layer. Obviously comes with a hood, which is great to have too. So stuff like this is 60% off, all right? And then for all else, um, there's still a pretty big size run of the Tarantula rock climbing shoes, which a lot of people like. This is a great all-rounder even you know, beginner into intermediate all day climbing shoe. There's full size runs for women, women and men here. So 30% off that. All right, so um, I have a couple books that I wanna, uh, I'll highlight them at the end, but um, a lot of this information comes from the classic Porcella Burns book, Climbing California's 14ers. There's also a Falcon Guide, Climbing California's Mountains. I'll give this to you guys here. You can look at them. I also recommend uh, Chris McNamara and Mackenzie Long's High Sierra Climbing, which is color topos of the best alpine rock routes. And then there's a really comprehensive climbing book that's not just the 14ers, but all of the High Sierra, which is this one, um, by Moynier, I think that's how you say his name, and Fiddler, Climbing California's High Sierra. And then lastly, after you buy Mountaining Freedom of the Hills as a climber, the next book you should buy is The High Sierra by R.J. Secor, which has all of the passes and mountains in the Sierra, all the technical and non-technical routes. So I'll give those to you guys to look at. And let's go ahead and begin with our presentation. And we'll look at what it takes to climb California's 14ers. Anybody? Colorado, yes, they have over 50 of them. Washington. Washington has one, which is Mount Rainier. Okay, so um, Colorado's 14ers, I've climbed more than half of them. I used to live out there, and those are great mountains. And uh, Washington's 14er is a great mountain too. It's a, it's a tall volcano. Um, Colorado's 14ers are a lot of rounded, eroded type mountains that start at about 10,000. There's only about 4,000 feet of gain. Um, California's 14ers, although not as many as Colorado, are a lot more technical and interesting with much better rock, shorter approaches, and more vertical gain than the majority of all the other 14ers in the United States. So we're at a great place to be 14ers climbers, all right? The 14ers require 4,000 to 7,000 foot ascents for many of them and good fitness is a requirement. So I, like we always say when we talk about climbing at the club, it's important that you, you are working out in some way so you can have maximum fun. Some of them require technical abilities to scramble, fifth class rock, 
um, a good portion of them you can do without having that sort of skill. But that would definitely help, especially when you're getting into the Palisades, for example. Um, make sure that you need a part. You you need to have partners to, <laughs> to climb these, typically because, um, like we were just talking about, there was a there was a search and rescue on Whitney last weekend, and you should go out with somebody. So hence, that's why we're here, so we can help you guys find partners that you trust and can climb with. And some of those books I just passed out; those are good to have, and maps also. Um, if you want to climb, uh, go in on the, uh, the where the 14ers are located, I'll try to give you a, an example of where this happens. Here's Los Angeles down here, okay? And up here would be just north of Bishop. So between those two is the majority of all the 14ers except for Mount Shasta, which obviously is way up here in Northern California. The, the one town that's closest to the majority of them is Bishop. So if you wanted to climb all the 14ers and didn't want to travel too far, just go to Bishop and live there for a couple weeks. You can knock most of them out. Okay, That's why we often find ourselves driving to Bishop weekend after weekend <laughs> in the club. It's a great place to go. So here's some of the things in, in addition that you're going to want. Also, I mentioned fitness already, but camping and backpacking experience is key. You want to carry as little as possible but still have enough to be safe, and you want to know how to get there and get back. Although a lot of the trailheads are accessible in California, um, finding your way on the route is another matter. So make sure that you're not going to get lost. So you can accomplish this by having some experience on your own, or of course, I should put in a plug for our training, like for example, Mountain One, all the mountain series helps you with navigation and these sorts of skills. So that's helpful. Let's go on to the next one. So we're going to start at the top of the state, which is Mount Shasta, and work our way down. Um, here's a couple things that are important to know about Shasta. It's quite a long climb. It's 7,000 feet of gain. Um, you do need permits to get on top. Um, it is one of the most prominent peaks in the world. It's on the top 100. So that's one reason why not only being a 14er, but being a beautiful scenic mountain. If you are lucky enough to stand on the summit and have a view, You'll, you'll notice that you're looking at about 10,000 feet of rise all the way around you, okay? So um, that's pretty awesome. And it's part of the Cascades, but it's the, um, the only one that's taller is the other 14er, which is Rainier, the southernmost of the Cascades peaks, except for Lassen. Let's go on to the next one. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, there is some red tape that's uh, part of this. You do need to pay for a summit pass to get above 10,000. You need to pack out all solid human waste, and there's a group size limit, so just be aware of that. Okay, let's go on. Um, the technical skills and fitness and other skills you need are listed here. Some of the routes require gl glacier travel and snow and ice climbing skills, but Avalanche Gulch in particular really just is a long snowy hike. Um, but if you wish to, you can climb the mountain on the glaciated side, which is probably more favorite of the club, judging by the number of trips that go there like the Hotland Glacier and the Bolum and the Whitney Glacier. So there's plenty of opportunities for all sorts of climbing there. A topographic overview of Mount Shasta looks like this. Um, here's the summit in the center of your map. Most of the routes come up from the south side, which would be right here, up the Avalanche Gulch route from Bunny Flat, which is pretty accessible from the town of Mount Shasta. A lot of the other routes that are popular um, and involve glacier and ice climbing are on the north side. Um, and there are some other routes on both sides of Avalanche Gulch, like Cascade Gulch and the West Face and Sergeant's Ridge that are, that are fairly popular. The routes that are on the, the western side by Shastina and on the far eastern side by the Winton and the Kanawakaton are the least populated, or the least climbed routes on the mountain. So if you want solitude, you can go there. Let's go on to the next one. Here's a little tour around the mountain. This would be Avalanche Gulch right up the middle here where this central red pyramid is. West Face, Sergeant's Ridge, Green Butte. Let's go around to the next side. Here's the north side with the Hotland Bolum Ridge straight up the center, the Whitney Glacier over here, the Bolum Glacier here, and the Winton Glacier on this side. Here's a picture of the north side. It's our favorite playground for doing crevasse rescue and uh, glacier travel. The Hotland Bolum Ridge, which is my recommended route to take, so it's not quite as crowded, but not as and about the same technical difficulty as Avalanche Gulch, which is not much, would be the Hotland Bolin Ridge, which goes right up here. Let's go on. So looking at Shasta from the popular route, which would be Avalanche Gulch, let's look at some of the numbers. You start at about 7,000. You go up about 7,000 feet. 
almost all people camp at Lake Helen or Helen Lake and it takes about eight hours two to three days and you should climb between May and July so we're done with the season <laughs> sorry about that one the reason is there's a lot of rock fall that comes off when there's not snow covering it so here's a little overview of what you're going to get if you climb Avalanche Gulch to go to Shasta um, the camp is at Bunny Lake excuse me um, Helen Lake uh, starts at Bunny Flat here's what it looks like there on a typical weekend so it's quite crowded um, it is still a nice route, but just don't expect solitude. Um, there are designated bathrooms in a ranger there, but no reliable water. Then uh, you wake up before, well before dawn, put on your headlamp and climb up the icy slope to Red Banks, which is this section right here, and then on to the summit. Um, you need to leave about two hours before dawn, and I, should, I would expect you to summit before noon and come back so that the weather doesn't get bad on you. And be careful on the descent. There's a lot of injuries and even some fatalities that have occurred in Avalanche Gulch because of the glissading or, or slipping on the climb or the down climb. So it's still a pretty icy slope right here in the middle between Red Banks and Helen Lake. And here it is. Once you get over that uh, portion called Misery Hill, then this is the summit castle of Shasta. That's the actual summit there. And uh, it's pretty spectacular mountain. It's one of my favorite 14ers. Let's take a look at some pictures of what goes on at the summit. We have the usual celebration of climbers doing their thing. You can see how small it is, and it does drop off like a, you know, basically in a cliff on all sides except for this little ramp right here. So it's a really spectacular summit. Let's go on to the next one. There's selfie sticks and partying of all sorts. <laughs> so it's a good route. Another one you may consider is Castleball Ridge, which is only slightly more technical, probably more interesting. Um, it does have this section here, which is called the catwalk, which is the only part that may be a little interesting, but can be combined with Avalanche Gulch, so it's your favorite route for early spring, late winter. Let's go on to that one. So that route goes right here, straight up the center, and you can look down into Avalanche Gulch. Um, we have a video of a climb of SMC's Castleville Ridge. Maybe we'll be able to get that queued up at some point. If not, you can find it on YouTube. <laughs> So let's go on to the next one. Going back to Hotland Bolum Ridge, my favorite route on the north side. Um, here's a picture of the sorts of things that are out there. This is called the Cat's Ears, which are along the way at about 13,000 feet. Here's the highlights of this route, why it's a favorite. You get to um, go on a high line between, some, between a few glaciers. Uh, there isn't any roped climbing needed, and it's direct and uncrowded. So it's a good one. Again, here's the route. This would be the Hotland Glacier to the left here of our red line. The red line begins pretty close to where we would camp, which is Marine Camp at about 10-6. You head right up the ridge through the rocks or through this ramp, and then past uh, the bench, the cat's ears to the shark's fin, the fumaroles, then up the rime ice to the summit here. It's a really interesting route and pretty straightforward. Okay, let's go on. Here's a picture of it from a photographic perspective. Here's Bolum Ridge variation, or Bolum Glacier variation on the side there. So you get, you get a chance to look at the steepest face and the most um, broken glacier on the mountain. So that's kind of nice to be able to see that, but not have to be on it. Let's go on. And here's another version of it from afar. Let's go on to the next one. Drive five hours to weed, take this is actually not right. This, is, this has changed since I did this. I just noticed it's not 22 miles anymore. It's more like eight, okay? And then hike in four miles to Marine Camp, which is about 10.2 to 10.6, depending exactly where you camp at, okay? Um, water's kind of hard to find. You may need to take, stake your tents out because it was very windy on that side of the mountain, um, but you do have a view of the route directly above your camp, so. This is a picture of the shadow of Shasta from up on the route during a sunrise <laughs> all right um, start early climb up 4,000 feet of snow mostly snow with little scrambly bits of rock um, be like on the avalanche gulch you want to summit by noon or earlier and be back to camp that day and you could walk out if you want to so you could do it in two days but three would be more comfortable like a lot of a lot of the mountains that we're going to talk about here's some pictures to get you stoked about uh, the north side here's the hotlam glacier ice fall and um, some other pictures of the Bergschrund and crevasses that are you won't be going through in the Hotland Bolum Ridge but you can see 
If you choose to climb the Hotland Glacier, this is the sort of thing you could go through. And if you take SIG 3.4 from us, there, that's one place that we hold it. Um, you could also ski down other portions of the mountain. And this one is off the Hotland Winton Ridge. It's a pretty awesome ski mountain also. So that's an added benefit. So as we leave Shasta and move south, the first place we're going to come to is Thunderbolt Peak. Does anybody know what subrange this is in the Sierra? Yes. Palisades. The Palisades, that's right. <laughs> so we're going to go through all the Palisades right down the chain. There's about five or six there, depending on whether you count polonium. Thunderbolt Peak is here. Um, the Underhill Kuwar is one that we have climbed, and also the North Kuwar, which is a Class 4. It was first done by... Um, Norman Clyde on a descent. <laughs> um, it's so called because one of the first climbs that went up there with some of the famous Sierra Club people, um, they had a fierce lightning storm on this mountain. So, hence the name. It's got a lot of great rock routes. This, this is probably the easiest, the Underhill Kuwar Class 4. It does have a pretty difficult summit block, which is kind of a 5859 unprotected blob above a bunch of talus. So, maybe bring some rock shoes and a little bit of nerve to actually tag that one. Let's go on to the next one. Next, moving down the chain, between these two is really nice low fifth class traverse. The next would be Starlight Peak. And it's a unique because coming north from Thunderbolt or coming from the south from the next one we're going to talk about, which is North Palisade, is a scrambly low fifth class climb. And I'm not certain if there's an easy way to get to it otherwise. Um, it has a really also famous summit called the Milk Bottle, which has, is the picture right here. So it's a great one to, to do in connection with Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt or North Pal, which is typically how it's done. Next would be the very famous North Palisade. Um, the routes that are on this mountain make it famous, plus also its prominence and position on the chain. Um, the most coveted of the summits, I believe, and also because it's tough, also include the option to climb U-Notch, which is a great snow and ice alpine route that has some rock, some snow, some glacier, maybe a little bit of ice if it's late in the season and is really interesting. Um, you can come at it from the west side, uh, class four routes from places like Ducey Basin, but I think the east side would be much more scenic and beautiful, so that's what I'd recommend. But. Any, any, how you can get, any way you can get it, North Palisade is a great prize and typically one of the last 14ers that people get to because it's tough. So what a great route. Next would be Polamonium Peak. So that is this little guy right here. So this would be North Palisade. This would be Polamonium and then going down the chain will be Sill next. But what's really cool about Polamonium is that you can climb another amazing ice route which is called the V-notch right here, a little tougher than the U-notch. Um, and that takes you to Polymonium, which like North Palisade, also has a nice rock, fifth class rock section to complete with some wonderful exposure before you get to the summit too. So like North Pal, you can climb a really cool ice route, throw some rock on top and get a really great summit. And it's like 14,001, I think. So <laughs> it barely makes the cutoff. Oh, there it is, yeah. So. And that's what, I already, that's what I already said. All right, let's move on to the next one. So Mount Sill is another favorite and quite prominent, um, beautiful mountain with much, it's got more mass than a lot of the others. So it's more of a standalone peak. Um, two of the favorite routes on that for us, and I think I could say speak for the public in general, would be the Swiss Arete, which is a three to five pitch low fifth class, mid fifth class route on this pretty beautiful position here on the Arete. And then the North Face, which um, you can, you can access as either a descent or an ascent route. And I've done them all various ways. Um, we often go to this mountain. Um, it's a perfect mountain for an alpine climber. Um, you, it's got some of the best views around and it's a really good summit prize, I should say. Yeah. Mount Sills is a coveted summit. Okay, next would be Middle Palisade. So this is still in the Palisades, but down the chain a little bit past Norman Clyde and Disappointment Peak and so on. It's in a different drainage than the Palisades proper. Um, it's the only one that tops 14,000. There are other peaks that are really worth climbing there, but this is the one that happens to be 14, so that's why we're focusing on it tonight. Um, the scrambling route is about class three, but it has some exposure 
Um, and we have a history of, ha we did actually climb this mountain on our fourth club attempt. We kept on getting snowed off and rained off and, and all kinds of things. So um, even though it's a class four route and isn't super technical, um, it still sticks up pretty high in the sky and lots of weather comes and goes around this part of the High Sierra like the others. So plan accordingly. Um, I have here a great peak for enchainments. You can uh, climb north or south from this mountain and tag a bunch of other 13,000 foot mountains which are really worthy summits. All right, so next moving down, we leave the Palisades and go to an area called the Williamson Tyndall okay, area. It's by Shepherd's Pass down by the town of Independence. So it's another few minutes down the highway and a couple hours down the, down the High Sierra by foot. <laughs> Um, Mount Williamson is actually the second highest 14er in California. It's a massive mountain. Um, it has a huge series of ridges um, and its bulk is quite impressive from far away. And it's a lot closer to the road than Whitney, so it appears to be and is a very large mountain. Um, it is uh, really close to another beautiful mountain, which is because it's kind of far back just behind it, you wouldn't also know that it's a 14er, but that's Mount Tyndall, which is coming up in a second here. There are lots of routes on Williamson, dozens really, and many of them are easy, but you can also do really long rock routes there up to whatever grade you'd like. So one in particular that I've always been intrigued by is the longest ridge route just about anywhere, which starts essentially from the valley there and goes up the east ridge, I think, all the way to Williamson. The first ascent of that was done by some hardcore climbers back in the winter, and it took them like three days to do the whole ridge. So <laughs> that sounds fun. <laughs> so let's go on to the next one. So Mount Tyndall is very distinctive. It has a Whitney-esque face here with lots of sparkling, beautiful granite. This begs to be climbed. But what's interesting about it is that as you go around the side here, the routes get easier and shorter. So you could start far to the right with the class three kind of ugly, loose route. If you don't like that one, you can go to the next one to the left and do something that's more solid, more steep, a little tougher, and continue around. Every time you move left, you're going to get a longer route that's steeper and more solid. Okay, so you choose what you want. Um, and it's almost always combined with Williamson because it's a rather long approach. Um, you have to go up over Shepherd's Pass and drop into a basin. I think it's around 12 miles or so. So it's probably a three solid three-day trip to get in there. And if you're going to go in that far, you might as well tag them both. So on to Split Mountain, the solitary mountain of um, the area near Independence. Um, or rather, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is down there near that. It's definitely south of Bishop. Um, it is unique. It's got, you can see it's got a bunch of different types of rock um, in the mountain. And you can climb this one by a class three route, but there's also a number of different gullies, rock routes, and even ice slash snow routes that you can climb to get there. And um, the, the most prominent of which is this central gully right here. Um, so when you're standing on the summit, you're standing on this side here, and then looking down deep into this gap. So that's why it's called Split Mountain. It has some of the longest arrets in the, in the Sierra and they go at around 5.8 to 5.9. The rock is pretty decent. So it's not, um, it's not climbed very often because it's a long drive in and it's kind of a complicated approach and there's no other 14ers around. So there's just a lot of uh, smaller peaks around it, but it's still worth doing, I would think, to go in there any time of year when you're able to do so would be great. Okay, let's go on to the next one, which would be moving down south. Mount Langley, I, you noticed I did skip Whitney, that's my last one. Um, Langley is the southernmost 14er. It's kind of dry and, and high, and uh, interestingly was the mountain that Whitney climbed thinking that he was climbing the tallest peak in um, the United States and claimed that he had, only to be disproven later. Um, but uh, there we go, right. So that's, I always think about that when I think about Langley. But um, it's a good one to climb. It's got lots of routes, a lot like Whitney, so you can do ridge routes and faces and snow climbs or just scramble to the top. So, let's go on to the last one, which would be, oh, I'm sorry, got to do White Mountain and then Whitney. White Mountain is the easiest 14er. Does anybody know why? 
Yeah, there's, you can drive up to within three miles of the top, okay? <laughs> the drive is long, and then the hike to the top is on a road. So if you want to start it out easy, folks, that's the one to begin with, okay? Um, it's not technically a part of the Sierra Nevada because it's actually across Owens Valley. It's so, um, and it's just barely in California. Um, but it is one interesting thing about it is these here, the ancient bristlecone pines, which are the, the oldest living things, many 4,000 years old, pretty incredible. So you can see that there. So it's kind of a different, it's kind of a different experience. Um, and it's a good one to figure out how you react to elevation. So if you've never been to 14,000, this would be a good one to try it out. Let's see how you do. You got a set of wheels, you can get down real quick. So <laughs> if, it doesn't, if, this is, if it doesn't suit you. Um, yeah, there's no water. It's kind of, it's really dry. But. All right. And then, oh, I'm wrong again. Then there's Mount Muir. I forgot about, I forgot, I forgot about Pips Creek Mount Muir. Um, it's just 15 feet over 14,000, and it's a sub peak on the Whitney chain. So you come up to the side of it on the Whitney Trail and pass around the back of it. So it's kind of an add on, I suppose you could say. It's a nice mountain um, in the fact that it's made out of the same stuff as Whitney. It's beautiful Sierra granite. Um, the, the climb to the top is just a little class three scramble, and most people can get it as a part of their journey to or from Whitney. Um, we attempted to climb it, of course, on the technical face, which is right up here on the eastern prow in November once, and we didn't get very far because it unfortunately had snowed just the day before, <laughs> so, but nevertheless, we forged on. Um, I haven't, uh, we don't have the experience um, that's worth relating coming at it from the trail side, but there's definitely routes all, all through here that don't get climbed much, very Whitney-esque type routes with plenty of route finding opportunity for you, <laughs> just like we encountered. All right, let's go on to, oh, and then there's Russell. Oh, man, I'm really off. <laughs> I thought I had gone directly south, but I guess I, I haven't given this presentation since last year, so I've forgotten. I apologize. Don't forget Mount Russell, a beautiful peak. Um, uh, Norman Clyde's, I think it was one of his favorites, and it's one of my favorites for certain. Um, it's got a unique shape, a number of, let's just look at the picture, all right. It's got a number of beautiful rock ridges that come down. Um, the Easter Ret, a really amazing route to go back and forth from the summit. And then others like Fishhook and Mithril, and all of these routes here are fairly tough, but no matter if you can climb them or not, you can appreciate this as a beautiful granite spire with long ridges. So, oh, right there. Um, the Easter Ret, it really is a very amazing route. In, in the book, um, I passed out the Sierra Climbing. It's the only Class 3 book in there. It's the only Class 3 route in that book. <laughs> yeah. So the reason is its exposure is thrilling, and the climbing is easy and long. So it's like going on a hike in the sky. You know, so that's a great one. But um, the others are come well recommended, like Fish Hookerette and the South Face and so on. And Mithril Dihedral, like I already mentioned, that's one that's, that's really popular too, a 510 beautiful crack route. All right, so let's go on to, oh, Mount Whitney, all right. <laughs> Everyone's favorite, because it's the highest peak in the continental United States, and therefore it must be the best, right? <laughs> Definitely popular. There's many routes to climb it. Um, I'm going to go through a couple with you. This is the face that I'm going to discuss. This is the East Buttress. And then there's the Mountaineers route here, and the standard hiking route comes around the back. Um, 14,505, it's a fairly tall ascent, just a lot like Shasta, 7,000 feet. And you do really need to have at least three days, and even more, you need to be lucky or good or both with permits. Plan accordingly, plan ahead. Let's go on to fun facts of Whitney. Um, this is really interesting. You know, being the highest peak in North America, it's not that far from the lowest point. I'm sorry, the highest peak in the continental U.S. It's not that far from the lowest point in the continental U.S., which is below sea level. So somebody came up with the idea to run a race between the two of those places, and that's called Badwater <laughs> in July. So <laughs> um, it's the most climbed high peak in the Sierra Nevada and one of the most climbed mountains in the U.S. That's you know, for obvious reasons. And then this is an interesting thing I like to talk about, too, is that it used to be the mountain was shorter, okay? <laughs> That's what the USGS thought or said. 
but it's just it's grown over the years. Now it's 14505. So I hope that maybe with increases in technology it'll continue to grow. That'll just make it even more attractive. So <laughs> Some of the geology, which is really interesting about this area, um, it's part of the batholith, so which is the, the granite shield that's been uplifted, kind of like a door on hinges. Whoop! And the eastern side is the part that's been heavily glaciated and eroded. So that's why all of the eastern faces in, this, in the High Sierra are the ones that we spend time climbing, okay? And why we always come in from Bishop. <laughs> um, so along the way, there's a bunch of other uh, mountains or little, little points that are all worth climbing in and of themselves, and yes, Mount Muir, okay? Um, but um, this is, this is uh, even, even with all my sarcasm, it is a beautiful mountain, um, well worth climbing, and the summit is always thrilling to look down this face on this side. And to look 8,000 feet down and out into the valley from the summit is pretty awesome. So let's go on. A um, few little red tape things you should know that you do need permits year-round. Um, the uh, time frame, I know it ends October 31st, and I think it begins in May 1st, would be the uh, lottery time for the, because there's a certain quota that, they ha that they're at, so they have to draw from, you have to get lucky to get on to get into the hike portion. Um, the better way to go would be to take the much shorter route, which is the Mountaineers route. Um, that one's much more accessible. And you can often get permits for that at short notice. But the Whitney Trail is on a lottery system. All right, let's go on. For a little bit of topographic overview for it, because I know this is a popular peak, I'm giving a little bit more time to it here. So this would be Mount Whitney, and here's the, the ridge that goes down to Mount Muir. Okay, The trailhead being down here, and marked in red is the trail that you take. Usually people uh, stay around here at trail camp for night one. And then they would go up to Whitney and then come back down and then come out. Or they might go up to Whitney, come back down, and go out on the same day. Here's the Mountaineers route over here, much shorter. It's only three miles versus 11. And so it's less crowded and it has a little bit more technical climbing. And then here's the east face and the east buttress. Let's go on to the next. So in terms of the, uh, the rock routes that are well worth doing and within the ability of many people in the club, um, would be the East Face route, which is a mid-fifth class, really exposed but not too difficult route, and the East Buttress, which is one of my favorite alpine routes ever. Seven to nine pitches of mid-fifth class, perfect granite, great belay stations, and beautiful, beautiful exposure on a ridge. You can tell which one I like. Um, the Whitney Trail, let's go through that a little bit. Uh, it's got, um, starts about eight, so you're going to have to go up about 6,000 feet or more about 10 miles or so, and you go to trail camp or Guitar Lake if you're coming from the other side. This is what it looks like, many, many switchbacks. Your first day's camp is here. Let's go on, I'll show you the, the trail, what it looks like. It goes by a lot of other granite peaks along the way, like Wutan's Throne, and both views of Russell, and some waterfalls. Day two, as you go up to Trail Crest, you're gonna go through the famous 99 switchbacks, which were done because um, a lot of the early people to climb Mount Whitney either rode on or carried mules, so it had to be mule-friendly. Okay, so the gradient is very low. Um, and some portions of it even have a railing. So when you get to Trailcrest Junction, you're on the back side of Whitney, then you just have to traverse across a very long talus slope to get to the summit. So I'll show you what that looks like next. This is what it looks like, <laughs> okay? So you start way over here and you go across all this talus, and here's Crook's Needle and Day Needle and Mount Muir is right there. Okay, so. But pretty cool view. Um, looking at the other routes on the Mountaineers route, we recommend you climb that when there's snow on the ground because it cuts down on the rock fall and the nastiness of going up the actual chute from, uh, from 13 to 14,000. That's what this is showing you a picture of here. That's why I say best for April to July. It is only class three, um, but there are portions of it that you could turn into class four or five, and if there's snow, don't underestimate it. Let's go on. Um, here's what it looks like on the way up to your first camp. This is Thor Falls, another of our favorite backcountry ice climbing um, destinations. And this is Ebersbacher Ledges. The, both of these are interesting stops along the way. 
on your way up to Upper Boy Scout Lake, which is about at 11,000. That's our typical camp site area. Okay, Upper Boy Scout Lake, you can look at Russell or the, the slopes that lead to Russell. And this is just a wall in front of you, <laughs> not Whitney. On top of that is a plateau with Iceberg Lake. And that's another possible location where you could camp out if you want to go straight to 12,000 and don't, aren't worried about getting AMS. <laughs> Let's go on to the next one. So on day two, when you go to climb Whitney, you'll be faced with this. That's Whitney itself. You'll come around to the start of the Mountaineers route, which is about 12 and a half, 13. And here's the chute that goes up to the notch at 14, which we'll go at next. Here's looking at, uh, here's looking down the route at, in late season, which I would consider to be maybe July. Um, this is Iceberg Lake down here, and when you're looking straight down the route, you can see it's quite rocky and broken, but really, really cool route because it's very straightforward. And the east buttress is right here, so you get to look down onto the Mountaineers route from there. And then looking the other way, if you were looking down, you would just turn a quarter turn and look up. The last 500 feet to the summit look about like this, depending on how much snow there is that year. You can go over here to get more uh, third, fourth stuff, and you go over here to get more fifth, and climb straight up, but if you have some snow, you can get 50 degrees or so. Top out. Um, this is what it looks like looking down the North Gully. This is the 14,000 foot bench right here. So there's a long slide down another many hundreds of feet down to the valley on the, ba on the back side. So this is definitely a place to make sure that you've got good footing. And the 5-8 East Buttress, which I think is probably more like 5-6, um, but that's what the guidebook says. Um, it's a great route because you can start really high and climb this prominent prow pretty much directly to the summit. So this is what you have in store for you. Six to nine pitches depending on how you climb it, and it's a good fun day out as long as the weather is accommodating. <laughs> so it's not easy to, to um, bail from, so make sure that you've got that in, in, in mind. Here's what it looks like. Um, a nice little approach will take you to uh, the first two or three pitches. Pitch three is one of the first cruxes, and then there's another one up here around the pillar, I believe. Um, it's been a couple years since I've climbed this one. But this is, the, this is the main portion of your technical climbing. So it starts off on the arete, goes more to like a face, and then ends up kind of on a broad section of the mountain that eventually um, degrades into class four for the last pitch or two as you get to the top. Here's looking down portions of the route. Um, the peewee pillar um, is this interesting rock that kind of juts out right about pitch three or four right off the ridge um, and then here's looking down in the lower half of the buttress from the top of that that area pitch four so you can see the exposure is pretty awesome but the climbing is protectable and, and not scary it's really great so that's the overview of all of the summits and all the peaks available for you guys do you have any questions I can we can run back in the presentation or go over something in general or in more detail rather if you have any about any particular peaks. Where to start? <laughs> Where to start? <laughs> hey, that, that's a good question. Um, I mean, it depends on what you want to do, but if we started with the easiest ones, White Mountain would be the top of the list. Um, Split Mountain would be easy to climb. Um, Tyndall and Williamson, you could start with those. And if you wanted to start with snow, recommended, um, then you would go to Shasta, of course, first. You could also start with Whitney because then you could get the tallest one and then go to all the technical ones. Um, the hardest 14ers to climb again are probably in the Palisades. I would say probably the hardest couple of those are, no surprise, Thunderbolt, Starlight for sure, North Palisade, Pulmonium. Those are probably the toughest um, in general, considering all the routes that are possibilities to climb. So good question. Oh gear that you might want to have for climbing 14ers. Uh, crampons, okay, just 10 or 12 point will be fine. Strap-on crampons are great. Um, you definitely want to have a mountain axe. This will be useful for all sorts of reasons. Um, crossing minor glaciers, climbing snow routes, and maybe a little tiny bit of ice somewhere along the way and using it as a, as a cane. It's a little bit more useful than a trekking pole. Um, 
you may need a harness on some of these routes so you can get really small harnesses like these nowadays which are appropriate for alpine climbing and mountaineering this doesn't take up much room in the pack and yes you should wear a helmet okay it's not geeky it's smart a lot of the um, close calls that we experience as a club are simply because the Sierra are the way they are because they're being they're constantly being eroded <laughs> and there's lots of rock fall out there in the mountains so protect your noggin that's the sort of gear I would recommend so when you come on official climbs with the club um, all the gear is included that's not clothing so this sort of stuff would be included plus you know technical equipment like ropes and protection and so on and then tents and stoves and so on if needed so we try to climb all of the 14ers in a given calendar year, and we've come pretty close most years. Um, some that I can say without reservation that we will climb every year, many times possibly, are Shasta, Whitney, got those done, then Williamson and Tyndall, those are often climbed. All of the Palisade peaks we do every year. Um, Middle Palisade, very often we climb that any year. Split. I don't know that we've climbed it more than twice in the last six years, but um, it has been summited by us. White Mountain, I don't know if we've ever sponsored a climb to White Mountain, but you can do that one, probably. <laughs> Anybody out there on your own, just got a vehicle in a couple hours, you got it. Um, and let's see, Langley, we've done a couple times in the years, um, mostly snow climbs there. Um, Muir, we've officially attempted it once, but it's been summited a lot. Um, and Middle Palisade, I already mentioned that one, I think. So the, the biggies like the Palisades and Shasta and Whitney and Williamson and Tyndall, that's the bulk of them. Those we really do climb every year, one way or another. So, all right. Any other questions? Palisades, what's the shape uh, did you guys go up this year? And what's the shape of the, uh, the cool bar is there to be? And yeah. Not? This year, I'm not certain if we've been there this year yet. But um, the, the shape of them has varied over the last couple winters. So the guidebooks will say that if you want to climb ice, you should go there in, say, sometime anytime after August. August to October is a good time to climb it. So because of all the drought winters we've had, um, I'd say that you should back that up by about two months. So we climbed, the last time I was there was the year before, we climbed the V-notch in May and it was already shaping up okay. Right. Um, so ice could form and you could be having it underfoot as early as June, the end of June maybe, or July. So um, they are suffering, the glaciers are receding, the bergschrunds are getting steeper and icier. So it's probably better to climb earlier in the season rather than later, like it might've been the case in years past. So I'd say a good time to get to the Palisades would be late June, early July. You'd have, the rock would be dry. You'd have ice possibly available. Definitely there would be enough snow on the routes. And the weather would be fairly decent still. <laughs> no. Any other questions? All right, let's head to the last slide here. Which is thank you. <laughs> and Mount Shasta. On my shirt. <laughs> They're both done by SMC Artist. Yeah, I got Whitney? Okay, well, you can get Whitney or Shasta tonight, if you wish. I, ha I do have some shirts here. We have some left over. Select sizes, if you guys have 10 bucks and you wanna pick up a shirt. That's our last, that's the last of them right there. So, thank you everybody for coming online and uh, thanks to our tech, Scott, for putting together a great presentation. I'm glad you guys came. And we'll catch you guys at the next seminar in a month. <laughs>